I have to tell you, I'm a, I'm a huge fan and simple because we don't use white noise machines in my house. When the E-52 flies over about 50 feet above our roofs, it's the most soothing <laughs> sound in the world. We, we, we truly believe that. I can tell you, you can follow him on Twitter, at AFGSC underscore CC, if you want to get the, uh, the real covert information. And then he tweets out 140 characters. Uh, I can tell you, he is a, uh, a consummate leader. Anybody can get two stars. I think they just give those away. It's not a problem. If you get your third star, you would come for But he really needs no introduction. He's the commander of Air Force Global Strike Command, Lieutenant General Stephen Wilson. Yeah. Closer to the mic, okay. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's great to be here amongst this uh, amazing community. You know, I've been spending a lot of time on the road. Unfortunately, lots of time in D.C. and unfortunately, lots of time in front of the D.C. press corps. And I know you'll be a lot friendlier than, than they are. <laughs> and I think we have some really good things before. But before I uh, go further, uh, Mayor Walker, it's great to see you and Adele. Uh, you talk about folks who get it and know how to support the military. Uh, there's none better than that. So to David and George at the Military Child Education Coalition and the, and the team there, uh, I'm looking here at Lisa Johnson who helped put, put that together. We got a great team going with, with, with uh, all that. There's about 2,000 military children who live in this community. And you heard the statistics and that. I was like, hey, you're picking my life story because we moved 70 <laughs> times. Our son went to 10 different high schools, or 10 different schools in his 12 years, three different high schools, and that's kind of the standard. Um, and so what they do for, uh, what Team Bozier and the Military Child Education Coalition do for our children is really important, and it's a big deal. I, I, so I go around talking to people, I said, it's, it's one of those touchstone things for fam military families, is, is where you move and where you settle and how you get settled in the community is important, and schools are a big part of that. So thanks for all the great stuff that you all are doing. I don't want to give away any secrets, but I'm thinking there may be some good news that will happen at the end of the month, uh, in about a month, to, to recognize some of the fantastic work that's been going on by the team here. Andy talked about a couple of things. I just want to put things in context to, to let you know a little bit about what's going on in the Global Strength Command. So we know there's about 25,000 people. Uh, Tom mentioned there's 1,000 deployed, uh, whether in the Pacific or Europe or around the world. There's about another 1,100 airmen that, that uh, are deployed to our missile fields and our missile complexes, taking care of that really important business. And, and I tell folks, while they're not deployed overseas, they are gone from their families. So it doesn't matter if you're 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away, you're still not there. And, and they do terrific work for us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they've been doing that, been on alert now for the last, since the shoot, 60s, a long time. Uh, let me also mention, Andy mentioned it about one of our airmen, he said, you know, one of his airmen downrange was injured. Well, he was. He's a senior airman, works in civil engineering squadron, he works at EOD. When I read the after action of what happened to him, it was almost a novel I couldn't put down. But you talk about a young hero. He is a young hero. Engaged in a very uh, big firefight, uh, pulling guys out of harm's way, uh, Bad guys shooting all around them. Uh, it's, a, it's an unbelievable story. I think more of it will come out in the near future. But from that, he got a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star of Valor, and Air Force Combat Action. Um, he, he's, a, he's a young senior airman assigned here to the 2nd Civil Engineering Squadron in our EOD. We got lots of folks like that. He's, he's one that's extraordinarily special, and he'll be coming back here in a little bit. Um, let, me, let me stop for a second and, and sink us back five years in time. Because our command is going to celebrate our fifth anniversary uh, this summer on uh, August 7th when we stood up five years ago. You know, we, we, can, we can track, though, our lineage. Our, our Air Force stood up 67 years ago. We stood up with five core mission areas in our Air Force. And quite frankly, they really haven't changed in that whole time. Part of that, what we started up with in 1947, we started our separate Air Force, a strategic Air Force. And back then we had... Uh, 
Curtis Lay was the head of our strategic air forces. That is our direct lineage. So in August of 2009, they stood back up strategic air force and they renamed it Air Force Global Strike Command. Back then the, the message was peace is our profession and the strategic air forces is quite frankly what we, what we used to know as SAC, Strategic Air Command. That, that was their model, and they, in the Cold War, they're the ones that, that sat on alert and went up when the Cold War. Well, today we're doing much of that same thing. We still have a lot of our ICBM forces on alert with crews that are out there in the fields and have big crews. That's, there's operators, there's maintainers, there's security forces, facility managers, there's chefs out there that, that take care of the, the people out in the missile fields, and they sit on alert. But it's bigger than that. So two legs of America's, so three legs in, in our nuclear triad. Two of them headquartered here. So besides the bombers, we have the ICBMs. Uh, and so they're, they're what I call the bedrock of our national security. They're foundational to the world that we live in. Without that, we, uh, adversaries could hold our country at risk. But because of what we do, and what the airmen out there do every day, all those uh, potential adversaries around the world think, not today, I'll pick some other time to mess with some other country, but not today. So let me talk about a couple things that have happened over the last five years. Uh, Tom mentioned it with the Secretary of Defense giving us an order, and the order says, send your bombers around the world and have them execute with every combatant commander at least every year. It's a really big deal. We've been reading it in the news the last two or three weeks while our B-2s and B-52s have been over in Europe and the news that is made. Uh, and anytime we move our bombers, lots of people pay attention. I can tell you the Russians pay very close attention to uh, where our bombers are. I say it sends a very important message, a strategic signal. All of our allies are very much assured by that and all our adversaries have to think again. You know, we did that uh, a little over a year ago when we sent B uh, B2s, well, both of them. We sent B2s to the United States from Whiteman Air Force Base on a 38 hour mission. Okay, like I said, again, on a 38 hour mission. Um, three captains and one major. We sent them to Korea, and we had a target, believe it or not. The target was to fly by Osan Air Base at high noon. And we knew people would take pictures of them. We wanted that B-2 to be what we called outrigger in the F-16s. It was conceived, thought of, developed, pushed up to the White House by Tom's folks in the 8th Air Force, uh, executed by the 509th Bomber. But on that 38-hour mission, there was five air refueling, so there was a million pounds of gas passed. They had uh, all kinds of coordination with all types of people to make that happen. And sure enough, it happened. The, the high noon, the B-2 flew over us on Air Base. Somebody took a picture of it. It went out on Twitter within 10 minutes, and we were following it. And, and, and within a, uh, an hour of that happening, the little Twitterverse was going crazy with, did you see the B-2 here in Korea? And that was the message we sent. And the, the message again to our allies is, we're here, we have your back. And to those would-be adversaries, pick another time and place, because we can go anywhere in the world, the time and place of our choosing, with a, with a power projected platform. So we did it with the B-2, we also did it with the B-52. And I think it sent a very clear message. Uh, I don't have to go much back in the last, within the last five years, executed again out of Marksville Air Force Base with this, our 608 Air uh, Command and Control unit there. But we sent B-2s to Libya. Let me tell you how we will again take this for granted how warfare has changed. Uh, the mighty 8th in World War II would send 2,000 bombers on a mission to strike one target. Well, the world has changed, now we send one bomber to strike tens of targets, and they don't miss, uh, and they're really good. So our B-2s that went over to Libya, quite frankly, destroyed the, the Libyan Air Forces on the ground before they even got started with the B-2s that did that. And that was the opening salvo of, of uh, Operation Asiyan. It, it can do some pretty, pretty terrific stuff. Now, our Air Force has gone through some really tough budget times. We still are. And so we heard the word sequestration. None of us even knew what that word was a couple years ago. Now we have to live through it. 
But what they said is our nuclear forces get prior. And so while the rest of the Air Force in many ways stood down, we didn't stand down our nuclear forces. But they got a priority in flying hours and funding to be able to make sure that they're ready. Because we, we can't afford our strategic forces to ever go what I call yellow or red. We always have to be green. And so we were, so we got a priority to be able to do that, and, and uh, Andy and the team executed superbly uh, during some really tough bunch of times. We've got a couple things going on right now. We, the acronym we call this FIP, but I'll we call it Force Improvement Program. And I am really, really excited about this. And we've had lots of people come and look at the nuclear enterprise. And, and quite, uh, you know, we all know, we, we took a hiatus on it paying attention to the, to the strategic forces from when we stood down Strategic Air Command in, in 1992 to when we stood it up in 2009. So we had about a 17 year gap where folks weren't paying the type of attention it should have been. But we had lots of studies, lots of really smart folks from the top who looked down into the enterprise and gave us recommendations to make us better. And we're implementing many of those. What's important about this force improvement program is this isn't top down directed. This is bottom-up directly. These are from the young airmen and the lieutenants and the NCOs that are doing the job. And they're coming to us with, here's how we can do this better. And here's how uh, we, can, we can be more efficient and make the mission happen. And so it's their idea. And so we're clearing all, this, all the obstacles to their success out of the way, so whether it be processes, procedures, and people, and they're seeing real change happen. And it's really empowering to them. Um, and, and they get it. And now, not only they get it, because it was their idea, they own it. It's theirs. And they, they take ownership of it and want to see it succeed. So I'm seeing some really good, good stuff happening in the missile community. And we're doing now the same thing with the 8th Air Force. So people said, is this because of, no, this is nothing. 8th Air Force is doing great stuff. But I think this is will need to make them better because, again, the young people who are doing the mission. The ones who know best, come tell us what we need to do to fix it, and we'll get after it and fix it. Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force have been really receptive to this. Uh, let me tell you what they've done. Uh, so far, this year, in the last 60 days, they've given me $72 million. Wow. So that was, that's, yeah, that was good. That was, all right, yes ma'am, I'll take that money. <laughs> we got lots of uses for that money. But not only did they give us money, but they gave us some manpower. Uh, we've we've uh, wanted to articulate we need to have the right people, not only just the right number of people, the right skill sets. So we, we have, certainly have some apprentices, and then we have some, some technicians, and we have master technicians. We need the right skill sets, the right people at the right basis. And so she has agreed to we're going to get 100% manning across our eight critical nuclear skill sets. That's a big deal. Not only that, she's added a little over 1,100 uh, funded positions to our books. So in the next six to nine months, these people will be coming on board to help out some of our men. So while the Air Force is downsizing, Air Force Global Strike Command is upsizing. I think that sends another really important message. What I've just also just kind of outlined is that doesn't come free. Uh, on top of that, with these initiatives, she's added almost a half a billion dollars over the, the five-year defense plan to Air Force Global Strike Command. So, as she would say, she's putting her money where her mouth is, um, and, and quite frankly, we're the beneficiary of that. So, I, she's been very, very supportive of our efforts. Um, let me talk about the future. Let me talk, it, it, you kind of highlighted a couple things from the folks at the table, and they're doing some amazing stuff. We got folks working to uh, enhance our sensors and our technology in the missile fields um, and bring some really needed improvements to, to the workforce out there. We're working on a new ICBM. The current ICBM, the Minuteman 3, was built, designed in the 60s. The first Minuteman was actually employed, built, stood alert, the Minuteman 1 in 1965. Current Minuteman 3 has been doing alerts since 19, early 70s. So we're going to replace that here in about 2030. So we're going through the design and build of that new Minuteman replacement. Uh, that's some really exciting work that's going on. Andy mentioned the Connect for the B-52. The B-52 
uh, what an amazing airplane, an icon. I jokingly call it the, the iPhone, like Jerome Kowalski would talk about. I got a nap for that. I can just put something on it and it does some amazing things. <laughs> you can slap whatever on that, on that airplane, it, it's going to be amazing. Connect is the big important piece. Because okay? it gets it out of the old analog world into the digital world, connects that airplane globally, and then I throw the different uh, standoff weapons on it, and it's, uh, it's going to remain a, a powerhouse weapon system for the United States Air Force for years to come. Same thing with the B-52. B Most people think of the B-2 as new modern technology, and it is. It's, it, it, it's a, an incredible airplane. Designed in the 80s. Its 25th anniversary of its first flight will be here in a couple weeks. So that, the B-2 is 25 years old. Right, so that's why we're building a new long-range strike bomber replacement. It'll come out in the mid-2025 period. Uh, and it will take all the technologies out there today. It'll be cutting edge. We're going to build 100 of them. Uh, and we're, we're closely connected with Air Combat Command on how we bring that new airplane on board. Besides the airplanes, all the weapons, so whether it be the, the, the B-61, which is one of, the, one of the legacy nuclear weapons, we're, we're working to redesign the tail kit on that to get rid of all the different variants out there to go to one variant so we can, in essence, reduce the number of large number, the number of nuclear weapons out that we have out there, by cutting it almost in half. Um, we're also working on a new replacement for what's called the Alpha Air Launch Cruise Missile. Again, designed in the 70s, built in the early 80s, designed the last 10 years, it's now been on duty since 1985. So what you hear the people in the military jargon call the long range standoff weapon, LRSO, we're working hard to be able to get that and we're trying to get the money as well as the new warhead that goes into that. Um, I haven't even mentioned new helicopters for our missile fields because we're working on to get new helicopters. We're, right now we're flying UH-1, so the same things we're flying during Vietnam. You know, it's Huey. We're still flying. Uh, they, they, uh, they're old. Okay? They're just old. They're, they, they're, uh, we need a new one and we're, we're uh, advocating for that and I think people are paying attention. I would, I would leave you with uh, a couple things. I think the senior leadership uh, is, of our military, and I'm just to let you know, I spent Tuesday with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of the Air Force, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the four star head of Navy nuclear reactors in Washington, D.C., and we we're talking about our mission set, the nuclear triad. This is a, a national priority. It's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's bigger than the Air Force. It's, it's for the department, um, and the Secretary of Defense understands that. And so they're committed to make sure that the, the, the number one mission set in the Department of Defense, to make sure we have a safe, secure, and effective nuclear force, remains so. So we're getting lots of attention, lots of focus, and that's good for us. Um, we're going to continue to, we've been on a journey. We've been making improvements ever since uh, an incident in 2007. Um, but we're on a journey. But the journey, the trend line is everything is going in this direction, folks. We got, we got the right people, we got smart people, they're working hard, they're focused, the resources are coming our way, the banning's coming our way. We have a plan for the future in terms of those things that we need to take the, the nuclear enterprise uh, even further. And, uh, and so, let me just wrap up and say, when I think about it, I, I get to travel around, and lots of people say, so where do you live? And I say, I get to live in. Streetport, Louisiana, at Barksdale Air Force Base. And they go, what's it like? And I go, it's an amazing community. It, re it really is. We have some terrific people. They support our airmen and their families like nobody's business. They, I mean, there, there's, you won't find a better community support anywhere in our Air Force. I, I'd argue anywhere in the Park of Defense. And I think it's a win-win relationship for everybody. You know, here we have a big base. Headquarters here for two legs of the triad and lives here in Streetport, Bossier City. Lots of those families, you know, I think the military families uh, learn from you. They, they love this place. They go to your churches, they go to your schools, they, they, they're in your you know, community, they're in your workforce, uh, the spouse of dependents. It, this is a win win thing. In return, the community gives them a whole lot back to this space and all our and their families. 
they truly, truly love living here. So when I asked them, you know, the, the State of the Union, how are the State of Affairs, I think, I think they're going really well. I think they're going great for our command. I think it's going really great for the partnership, the teamwork we have between Bossier City and the base, and all the supporting units of the base. And I know I, I, I feel truly blessed to be part of this community and live here. So, yeah, thank you very much for allowing us in your community, for allowing us to talk to you about the kind of the state of affairs. Uh, before I get off stage, let me finish with uh, Andy. So Andy talked about he may get the relinquished command on August 1st. May, <laughs> may, he's still, he's still not decided. Um, Andy, I think you've done a terrific job uh, for 2nd Bomb Wing, Team Marksdale, as the installation commander. He's going on to work directly for the other Secretary of the Air Force. So we, we have a couple big key critical jobs for, for high power colonels that are on to, to, to bigger and better things. That's one. Uh, so I don't know if anybody's met Under Secretary Fanning. Fanning uh, uh, amazing guy, works with the Secretary very closely. He was hand, Secretary Fanning handpicked Andy to be his military assistant. Um, I think that speaks volumes for <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks for all you do supporting our military, our airmen, our families, and dependents. Mayor, thanks for uh, all that you do here, and Lisa, Team Bozier, um, thanks for all that you do. Thanks.